Hey there, Colin Marshall here, host of the Marketplace of Ideas, breaking in a little early on the podcast version to let you know that if you enjoy the program, you can help make it better by blogging about it, by tweeting about it, by Facebook status updating about it, by letting your friends know about it however you can. Because the more people listen, the better the program's going to be. Today on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with speaker, writer, blogger, podcaster, 43 Folders founder, and student of the creative mind, Merlin Mann. Merlin Mann is a writer, speaker, blogger, podcaster, and student of the creative mind. He's the creator of 43 Folders, a popular website devoted to time, attention, and creative work, as well as the man behind such varied projects as The Merlin Show, Kung Fu Grip, Fives, the 43 Folders podcast, one-third of the crazy successful comedy podcast, You Look Nice Today, and Lord knows what else. Merlin, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, there has rarely been a man for whom the for whom the phrase or the title productivity guru has been applied so often that less wanted to be called a productivity guru. What's your relationship to that label these days? Oh, man. The thing is, I think most people, if, like, if you're like me and you hear the word guru, you, you expect it to be in a headline with either Swindle or Ponzi. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> guru, a guru it's, it's a tremendous compliment when people say that. I think people say that because the 43 Folders website became, you know, fairly well known for trying to help people uh, with the same kinds of problems that I have historically suffered from. And, uh, and so it's a, I think it's a giant compliment in some ways. It, it, you know, it becomes a little bit of an albatross at a point because I don't, I mean, I'm not sandbagging. I, I honestly don't consider myself anywhere near the uh, level of expertise that would qualify me as a guru. Um, there, I, I talk about, I think the reason people like what I do, I hope is because, um, I'm not saying here's how to be great like me. It's like, here's how to hopefully suck less like me some days. And I think that's for the kind of work, the kind of stuff that I'm talking about, that's pretty different than a lot of the quote unquote gurus. So I just don't want to give people the wrong idea. How much was that the need that 43 folders tapped into when it became really successful, when, when it first became really successful? How much was that honesty, do you think, part of it or what need were were you tapping into with the site? Well, that's a good question. I think there's a couple parts. I mean, one thing I uh, I think is, is definitely true is the timing. It was something where, you know, it's funny. There's these certain things that happen, things that come along where you say, after it's been around for a while, you start to think, oh gosh, it's, that's probably been around forever. You know, like you hear Nirvana and you go, oh my gosh, how have we not had Nirvana forever? It seems so obvious now. Well, at the time, it seemed pretty crazy to have a website about, you know, Mac software and uh, life hacks and you know, personal productivity and these goofy programs like Quicksilver that I like a lot. And at the time, I thought, this, is, this has got to be the most insane idea in the world. But different people like the site for very different reasons. I mean, like I say, the timing part of it is, I think I really hit a zeitgeist. I was kind of standing in the right line at the right time. Because it, I think the topics of attention management <clears throat> and of, of wanting to be able to kind of deal with this feeling of being overwhelmed by information and calls on our attention really was a hot became a hot topic around the time that I started doing it. And, and yeah, I mean, I think I helped contribute to the popularity of those ideas in some ways, but I think it was good timing. But yeah, to be honest, I think the voice is is part of it. I think that's true for blogs. I think it's true for podcasts. Um, it's definitely true in radio. I think a lot of people uh, don't really care about a topic as much as they care about the the voice of the person talking about it, for better or for worse. So I hope that's why people enjoy it. Now, when I first became a reader of your site, and when a lot of my friends did, uh, we we... We came to it because of these topics you just mentioned, they have a very broad appeal. I mean, who doesn't want to be more productive? But I found myself among, among your fans, yeah, virtually among your fans, and what I saw around me was, was a lot of guys with um, thick glasses, not thick as in thick lenses, but thick chunky glasses with chunky frames, and they, they love Apple products, and they like to write in their Italian notebooks, and they care a lot about the kerning of the font Helvetica. And I, could, you, could you enrich this mental image I have? Who are these people for those who are your fans but aren't in this specific group? That's a, that's that's interesting. So you're doing some audience segmentation. You'd say that's that's one that's part of my demo. Well, that's what I well, I have friends who read your site and who listen to what you do and who watch what you do and who don't wear the, the glasses and don't think that much about design to be honest and don't uh, don't 
think very much about kerning and they do see these guys who seem to be they're the most visible of your fandom i'll put it that way and who are they because i don't want them to be that's characters. a terrific way to put it because uh it's, it's sort of i would consider it something of i guess a cognitive bias because you're going to see the talky people from uh, Brooklyn with the thick glasses who write for Pitchfork. For Pitchfork. <laughs> what you're not going to see is the very heavy shut-ins, uh, you know, who, who kind of can't leave their mom's basement and they, you know, they organize their dungeon dice. That's really the the, the broadest part of my demo, I think, because I've I've been that person and to a large extent I still am that person. Uh, well, you know what it is. It's funny the Apple stuff that you know I've heard some people call it the idiot tax that you pay for being an Apple fan, and I. I I say that without a hint of irony. It's true. I mean, I, <laughs> in addition to being an early adopter, who's often penalized for being an early adopter, I also buy lots of Apple stuff that I could get in a commodity format for less. So without getting into the usual kind of you know, platform turf war, I will say that I think people who are attracted to Apple stuff um, tend – I think the reason they're attracted to Apple stuff is because they like the idea of a little bit of extra polish – and of having a somewhat mediated Catholic experience uh, with technology, where they don't really want to have you know too much hands-on experience, you want somebody <laughs> to make good decisions for them, and you really do trust you know. And Apple's certainly not the only company where, where this uh, kind of relationship exists, but um, I think those are the kind of folks who are very interested in things like design, like you say, and who uh, are you know maybe a little anal retentive, you know. And, <laughs> I think the broader appeal of the what you might call the life hacks part of it, and again, I have to always credit Danny O'Brien. D- Danny O'Brien's uh, life hacks stuff uh, was really the biggest inspiration for the site uh, above anything else, far and away. Uh, and I think that stuff really appeals for good and bad reasons. Uh, for the good reason of we're trying to find modest ways to feel a little bit more in control of our life and a little bit more hooked into the stuff that matters to us. And I think the downside of it is, borne out by the thousands of sites, you know, pooping out nonsense on blog. Every day <laughs> is that there's really it's easy to get really wound around the axle with all that nonsense if you don't really understand why you're doing it and and finally i guess the thing that i've started to realize about about all of this stuff the, the thing that i kind of obsesses me now is uh that, that the ultimate hack if you like is learning when you have enough information about anything to just get going with it and so i think you know again that's why i don't post as much on the site unless i have something to say and increasingly, I kind of don't want to overserve the audience of people who want, you know, tips on what pencil to buy. You know, I, I want to—I I don't want to help people uh, buy notebooks. I want to help them write great stuff in the notebooks. Uh, that was a long, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, you've talked a lot. You've hit on a lot of things I very much want to talk about. But I want to go back first to you mentioned the shut-in who can't get a lot done that forms a lot of your audience as well, and how you once were that yourself. <laughs> and what, this actually opens up something I really want to ask you about because. I talk to friends who are Merlin Man fans, avowed Merlin Man fans, and they... <laughs> I hear about these people. I never meet them. Yeah, well, they, they're too scared, sometimes. too scared. Like, is it, could it be a mass hysteria, Colin? I, cause I, I, don't think, I, don't think that, I don't think that exists. I think it's a made-up thing. Well, okay. I guess they, they may, I may know the only ones, but they, I talk to them, and they, they seem to envision you as a man who was born in 2004, already a 30-something, already riding <laughs> high on 43 folders. Is, have you cultivated the man without a past, or what's going on here? Because, oh, gosh, no. I mean, okay. uh, this is just one part of a lifetime. Well, you know, I think, I, I, I gosh, uh, I never really thought of it this way, but I guess I, I, I'm generally, no, I'm not generally. I am extremely bored by resumes. Oh. Maybe this is something that came out of working around a lot of engineers and uh for lack of a better word, technologist, but I really like the idea of, of almost a meritocracy where you, uh, sure, you want to be able to have things you're proud of that you've done, but in the same sense that a writer is only a writer when he or she is writing, I think we're all as good as what we're doing right now uh, in some ways. So, you know, I, and people don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever met these people? Have you ever met these people and the first thing they want to do, they, the first thing they want to do is give you their oh card? Oh, my. You know? <laughs> that's okay. I understand you're networking or whatever. But, like, I'd rather just have a conversation. And to me, that's what I'm doing. I'm just talking to people. Uh, I, I have made no attempt to cover that up. I've been a basket case. Colin, I've been a basket case for my whole life. There's no question about it. Um, I used to play in bands. I, uh, I almost flunked out of high school. Uh, I had to beg to get into college. I did a lot of fast food jobs. Lost my father at a very young age, so I kind of grew up as a latchkey kid in Ohio. Uh, ask me anything. I've, I've made a lot of terrible, terrible decisions like to this very day. Well, what specifically, I guess, is important to get out there about you is you say you start. when this is very admirable, I think, is that you started 43 Folders with the aim of publicly working on things that you sucked at. I want to know how bad you sucked. 
Well, it, you know what it is? It, there's good days and bad days. And I think that's true for, for, for anybody. But I mean, specifically, my specific recollection of, I guess, so when I say it was good timing, I think it was good timing, not just for the site and for the, the idea of success, which I never had on any, not just, you know, to be not, not to sound immodest, but I had no idea the site would become as popular and ultimately successful and ultimately career changing for me as it was. I had no idea. Um, the thing was, as far as my own timing with this stuff, around the same time I learned about Danny O'Brien and the life hack stuff, not long before that I learned about David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. Uh, and I'm absolutely not the kind of person who sits around and reads self-help books. I mean, I've read a few and they always just, for the most part, just make me disgusted. But I was, what I, what I, if I go back and I think about in my head what made me realize I needed to really work on this stuff was a time when I was working as a project manager. And I just felt like, all of the tools were failing me. I felt like my skills were failing me. And I felt like, you know, given that we were all just basically moving information around, it became crazy to me how much of our day was eaten up with all of this meta work, you know, planning meetings, canceling meetings. Have you ever tried to plan like a phone call with eight people? Have you ever tried to do that? <laughs> That's the kind of thing I was doing for five different projects. And pretty soon I, I really felt like I was losing my mind. It was, it was like trying to shoot a bullet with a bullet. And, and so that's around the time that in retrospect, I could, I could, you know, sound really sage about this. What I realized at the time was I need to get some help with this. I didn't have anything like the kind of larger view about it that I do now since I've had the, uh, I don't know, I guess I've had the freedom to think about this stuff a lot. But at the time I just realized, Hey, I need some tricks here. I need to like, what I now realize is like defensive driving. I need a way to not get run off the road every day. And so that's why an obsession with email and an obsession with all these kind of time-saving applications, um, that's, that, 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 I think that's where it came from for me. And, and, and how much did I suck? Well, you know, I just really started to feel like, I don't like that word effective. I think it's a really dumb word, but I felt very ineffective. I felt like although I was working really hard and trying really hard on my, you know, web development work and my project management work, I just felt like I wandered around a lot and I wasn't actually accomplishing much. And I'd get to Friday feeling really kind of blue about what I'd accomplished. And I just didn't like feeling that way. And so when it came to, when it came to posting essentially about your failures and how you might address them on the web, where did, where did the idea, I don't want to ask where the idea came from. Nobody can ever really trace that back, but what was the no, decisive okay. point? <laughs> What was, what was the decisive point where you decided, I've got to put something online that talks about how bad I am at this? <laughs> well, no, no, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I, that's, not, that's not the way I thought of it. The way that I thought of it at the time was that I, I had gotten into the habit of, there were a few things, and again, I mean, really, 43 folders, you can call it whatever you want in retrospect, but what 43 folders was about in the early days was really three or four topics for the most part. It was about the larger issues of personal productivity, yeah. Uh, it was very much, I think, very focused on things like David Allen's Getting Things Done book, very focused focused on the, uh, a more kind of rarefied idea of Danny O'Brien's life hacks stuff and was really focused on a couple applications that were changing the way I used my Mac, including especially Quicksilver. So, I mean, I could say it's about Macs and productivity, but really it was about three or four things that were just my obsessions at the time. And, and what I realized was, um, in a general way, I realized that I had a lot to say about this stuff. And, and what I realized in a very specific way was people were saying, okay, enough with the emails about your Quicksilver tri tricks. Why don't you just go put this on a blog somewhere? <laughs> you know? And I, what's that term they use on Metafilter? Um, G-Y-O-B. Uh, oh, yeah. So, they have a lot of <laughs> so proprietary terms on I got, Metafilter. Got my own web blog, and we'll leave off the F. But, um, and I did. And so. I think that's how it started. I remember a specific conversation with Doug Bowman, the guy who does uh, Stop Design. And he was like, you know, we sat there at lunch one day and, and he, I showed him all this stuff in Quicksilver. And it was like making a lady disappear. I mean, Quicksilver is like a magic trick if you've never seen it. And he was like, well, you should write all this down somewhere because this doesn't exist. There was no, there's no book for Quicksilver. And so that's kind of where it started. I just wanted to, I've, I've said it before, I wanted a parking lot to put all that stuff. And uh, it didn't come out of me wanting to go and like, and again, I mean, it's, 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 it, this all sounds ridiculous in retrospect since blogs have become such a thing. But in 2004, blogs were just blogs. You know, there, there, there were breakout superstars of blogging from the beginning. I mean, you look at something like bifurcated rivets or, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, John Barger's uh, Robot Wisdom. There was brunching shuttlecocks. There was amazing blogs in the early days, but it wasn't like a business. You know, I had just had tons of web properties of one kind or another since 1995. And so this is just another one. You know, one day I started a TypePad account. I turned this thing on and started posting, you know. Now, we've gone over how successful this this 
I don't it's want to been say. moderately successful. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's easy to see this from the outside and say, you know, blah, blah. But it's, you know, it's, it's a blog. A few people look at it. It's not, you know, it's not freaking, you know, Candide. It's a blog. <laughs> <laughs> by blogs, by blog standards, it became quite successful. With oh, this. that's a pretty. I gotta tell you, Colin, <laughs> blog standards are pretty. That's a high bar. <laughs> and you, we'll get to blog standards, sir. I'll, I'll assure you that. But the uh, the forty three folders with in this original iteration, it, it gets popular. We'll say that. But yes, it, really and it happened interest- very quickly. This all happened. I mean, it kind of rocketed up within three or four months. Yeah. I was, I had, I had signed uh, my part of a book deal w- within less than a month at the time. I mean, this really went fast. It was completely overwhelming. It was absolutely overwhelming to me. And I, I guess I'll draw a bit of an analogy here, and it's going to be a strained one. But there's on the episode of the E! True Hollywood story about the new kids on the block, um, I believe Donnie Wahlberg is, is quoted to remark that the new kids on the block also became very successful quite quickly, and then they became even more successful. And then at one point, Donnie says, with all the merchandising and everything that was happening, he said, you know, at a certain point, we looked down the, down the hallway and we saw marbles rolling toward us with our faces inside the marbles. That's how far the merchandising had gone. And it seems so weird and so wrong. And did there come a point in the, this first part of 43 Folders existence where you had a your face in the marble moment where you thought something has gone a little wrong here? Well, thank God I turned almost all that stuff down. I mean, I'm the first one to admit that I've tried a lot of different squirrely things to make money with the site and abandoned pretty much all of them except for advertising at this point. But, uh, you know, you know, the funny part is what I rejected. I mean, the stuff that I rejected is what was hilarious. The, the face in the marble for me was the big one. Uh, I was contacted by a very well-known maker of fancy, you know, things to put in your pockets and briefcase. <laughs> and uh, they wanted to make, so I did this thing called the quote-unquote the hipster PDA, which is just a stack of index cards and a binder clip. It was kind of a joke, but it's also, you know, it's like like a lot of what I do. It's a joke and not. Uh, and uh, but I was contacted by this company who was like, "Well, here's what we want to do. We want to make a branded thing to hold the index cards, and then we're going to make branded <laughs> 43 folders cards." And uh, and I mean, you laugh, but I mean, these exist now. This company makes that. They just don't call it that. They without acknowledging me at all. <laughs> not that they need to. I mean, part of the joke is it's just index cards. But it, it, indeed, indeed, it is just index cards. So the whole notion was to take something, a commodity that you can pick up. At a, at a drugstore and say, you know, and the way I look at it in retrospect now, the way that that idea became powerful to me or, or became sticky was it's a way of saying, I have everything I need to do something awesome right now. I don't need a fancy notebook. I do like the fancy notebooks. I love those. I used to love those uh, fancy Italian notebooks you mentioned. But at the same time, I think a lot of it in my head now is about having everything I need to at least get started, everything I need to do a little bit of work on something that I care about. Um, but yeah, it became crazy. And the part that became most vexing to me was the the PR people. That's that's what started to drive me nuts because this sounds like a first world problem, but if you think about it, it's really not. It's it gets it's weird when you're not sure who your friends are anymore, and when you're being contacted by people who are acting all nice. And if your self esteem is as weird as mine, you tend to like play along for a while, and then you realize they're just trying to get you to link to them, and. You know, if you're not big by blog standards, that doesn't sound like a big deal. But that that does not scale. If you're constantly being, you know, do you know what I'm saying? It's it was was, it's just frustrating. And I I see my friends, I see people like Matt Howie facing this now. Uh, You know, um, I see. I I imagine Jesse gets this on some level. There's it doesn't cost anything, you know, to basically be a dick. And and you can go and waste a lot of people's time and attention for completely selfish reasons, and then be very high handed about it. And I'm kind of trying to do the opposite. Uh, for myself. Uh, I, I'm trying to hopefully not waste people's time, and, and but also be very accepting of the fact that what I do is not for everybody. So to me, that was that was the face in the marble part, was just the was being confronted with this surfeit of incredibly selfish people who just wanted to sell something and didn't care at all about my audience or me. So that w- it was frustrating. And, and after a time, I really started to feel, even though I th- I, I've never thought what I did was really bad. I've always been pretty proud of what I did. I think it's easy to read things I've written and think that I just, you know, that I, I have bad self-esteem. But I don't. I like my work. I just, what your work is always in context with other work. And so for me, what I was doing in 2005, I think was pretty good. But by 2006 or 2007, there were so many people doing the same thing I did, but really badly that I started to feel like I was living in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> and I really just wanted to reject kind of, you know, just reject out of hand so much of the stuff that would associate me with all these carpetbaggers. 
So, yeah, it's weird. I, in a, a lot of ways, I think I'm a lot of, is it Donnie? It was Donnie? It was Donnie, right? Not Mark. Uh, I believe it was Donnie Wal. Yeah, well, Mark Wahlberg was, of course, not in the band. He, Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, but uh, Donnie he Wahlberg. Was, he, was, he was allied with them, though, right? Did they tour or, or they didn't? Oh, maybe. I, I, this, you're getting into territory I am not qualified to speak to. I remember Donnie was in that movie. He was really good. Uh, what was he? He was in the beginning of that movie. Uh, Sixth Sense? Sixth Sense, exactly. He was great in that. Yeah, it turns out Bruce Willis is a ghost. Oh, come on! <laughs> statute of limitations. Oh, really? Do you have a sense of that? Is there a sense for you of, of when the statute of limitations on a spoiler runs out? Here's what I think about spoilers. I think that I can give away spoilers as much as I want because if a narrative is truly ruined by revealing the plot points, that's a bad narrative. That's a Gene Siskel point, right? Isn't that Gene? Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's a similar point. Gene Siskel, Roger Ebert's forever talking about this. Gene Siskel had this thing that said, <laughs> no, you know what? It's a little different. Gene Siskel would say, like, if your entire plot turns on an, uh, on an extremely simple misunderstanding... Like, you probably have a problem. And if your entire yes. plot turns on not, you know what I mean? It's like, that's, <laughs> you know, that's all, two hours is a long time to, like, watch a magic trick. Although, I'll tell you, my friend, I'll tell you, I'm pretty good at that. I've watched a lot, a lot of Law and Order. I'm pretty good at knowing how clues get telegraphed. Sixth Sense, I had no idea. No idea. They totally had yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, too, too bad the wad was shot after that uh, for M. Night Shyamalan. Well, it seems like he's... Um, it seems like he does the. Am I correct in saying that he continues to try and make movies where basically there's a trick? Um, to an extent. I mean, it seems like he's tried to get away from it, but uh, I've I've sort of I've stopped watching them at this point. Yeah, yeah. You know, how about this? How's this for us for for a statute of limitations? Okay. Uh, if a Friday, uh, Fresh Air with Dave Davies uh, has a, an archived interview to celebrate the DVD re-release of a movie, at that point you're officially absolved. I think I like it. I think we're going with that. What would we call that? What would we call oh. these? The, they call it the Davies window. I was going to use Davies, certainly. Yeah, the da- <laughs> Davies window. Um, the, the Davies Davies Law. Is Davies, uh, Davies Law. Dave, Dave Davies. He's 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 named after one of the kinks, right? Now, which one is he? He's he's Dave Davies. Is that right? Yes, I, I, my expertise is failing me at this point. I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, come on, aren't you a big Fresh Air nerd? Um, you know, I actually, I, I'm going to make an admission. I don't listen to Fresh Air. Yeah, I used to. It drives me crazy now. <laughs> well, I know, I know your favorite program is StoryCorps. Oh, I love StoryCorps. They, <laughs> they, 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 they talk to elderly people and make them cry. <laughs> I, I was hearing this, and we're getting so off topic, but let's go for no, it anyway. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I was hearing this American, I don't listen to that much StoryCorps, and I would always hear you rag on it, uh, well, you know, occasionally. I'd hear, I'd hear Jesse talk about how much you hate StoryCorps, and I'd think, oh, could StoryCorps be so bad? And then I heard of This American Life that lifted some StoryCorps, and it was the story of, like, a New York bus driver talking about how he picked up an old lady who didn't know where she was, and so he drove the bus like a limo, and he, he found the old lady's old person meetup group and that old lady said it was the best day she'd ever had even though she'd just been diagnosed with cancer and i was oh, like see there's a twist they took it and they turned it that's good <laughs> this is parodically maudlin i can't believe it well you know why you know why that became a tal story because the tal story has got to have the double twist oh right? yes got to have this guy you got to have the guy who sounds a little bit like ira glass doing it and then <laughs> and then there's a twist and you go ooh, and then the music changes and they play the dj shadow and you know that's twist one and then there's a little more talking, and then there's a pause, and there's a little bit of Yola Tango, and then they come back, and then there's more talking, and then there's the kind of disclosing producer part of the show where they're like, I wasn't even sure by this time. The, the yard had been empty for six weeks, and all the robots had gone home. I wasn't <laughs> sure what to do at this point. And then they play a little bit, you know, they get a little, little bit more of the music, and then you get the uh, second twist, right? I think that's, yeah, that's like that. But, uh, but on StoryCorps, the twist is usually old person has There's cancer. There's no twist. There's no twist. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a completely sanitized, sentimental version of the past that has none of the teeth or texture of adult life's complexities. It's a completely maudlin attempt to cash in on middle-aged people in fleece who don't have much of an emotional interior world. Also, it's recorded in a Okay, here we go. And here's, here, here's my lyrics I read for you. Ready? Ready? <clears throat> Okay. Story core, story core. I wonder what that story is for. Story core. That's how it goes. It's the lyrics I read. Bravo. I sing it every time it comes on. So anyway, I'm, I'm still kind of working it out. But oh my, oh we got to get on. We got to get on the rails. We got to get back on the rails. It's a business. It's a business, Colin. It's a business. <laughs> they go out. I mean, they're not doing that just because they love old people. It's a business. They sell books. And any time that somebody's in a position to make you feel something emotionally, you have to ask yourself what they get out of it. And if what they get out of it is it means a lot to them to tell a story, that's great. But what I hear is whatever every Friday, 
they sit around in a bus and make immigrants cry. And I don't, I don't <laughs> think that's storytelling. Once you've seen The Wire, you're spoil, spoiled for life. Now I expect people to tell me a complicated story. Anyway, that's all. You'll cut yeah, this out, right? You'll cut this out. Oh, this this will be left in. Don't right. worry. Well, I, I don't. <laughs> now, what I was going to go toward is is that the fascinating thing here, talking about the arc of forty three folders, is that there's been, of course, as your fans know, as the teeming millions of Merlin Man fans we've discussed know, that there's been a change. There's been a change in yeah direction of forty three folders toward the end of last year. You. You decided to take it in a new direction, moving it from, I would say, a blog about productivity, a blog with productivity tips, to, I guess, it's more like from from tips about doing stuff in the abstract to how stuff is actually done concretely. Would that be a good way to put it? It is. And, and the thing is, for anybody who doesn't know what a blog is or doesn't care what a blog is, it's important to understand that... Just for, to answer your question, yes, that that's one part of it. I, there was actually a lot of changes that happened as I look back in retrospect. But but here's the thing: if you just for your audience who who doesn't follow this kind of nonsense, a blog you know a blog started out as this idea of being a public kind of journal where you posted links and you posted ideas and you said things and it was personal publishing made easy. Um, but but again, by by the mid two thousands, it became very profitable <clears throat> to generate a lot of page views and get a large audience by posting very often throughout the day. And I mean, let's 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 not let's not mince words. There, there, you could make a lot of money from a blog. I mean, something like TechCrunch started out as you know it's a blog. I mean, it was a business, but still. And now we're to the point where you hire writers, and the whole the the whole way this racket works is you post a lot. And you get people to come and look at as many pages as possible because those ads are how you get paid. Okay, so I'm not, that's not a criticism. That's just that's how it works. And anyone who says otherwise is mostly lying. Um, and so the thing was, I did that and I made pretty good dough off of it. I was with a, with a company um, until recently that um, I want to phrase this correctly. I was with a company until recently that has been really good to me in terms of getting um, ads that people charge a lot for. Uh, now, so, so what I decided was several things. First of all, I decided that I didn't necessarily want to be an ad salesman for the rest of my life. I didn't want to have to th- really f- form my work around the idea that the only way I can feed my daughter and my wife and me was to post a lot of whatever for whoever. I did not like that. Second, I didn't like the topics that I was being encouraged to kind of post about. People wanted nonsense. People wanted something to distract them for a little <clears> while. And that's something I increasingly was uncomfortable doing. So really, I kind of did two things at once. Um, and some of those changes are only starting to happen now, where I've moved to a different ad company. I have basically one ad on the page. And I'm, I'm posting when I feel like it. I don't feel any pressure at all to post anything at any time. And so, and, and again, I'm not trying to sell you a hero or something. I'm just trying to say that that's where my head is. There's other places I want to spend my time other than churning out a lot of stuff that I've half thought about. By the way, the change in the visual look of the page, love it. <laughs> That's an experiment. I mean, if you're curious, are you, are you, are you nerdy about HTML at all? Uh, well, I'm nerdy about HTML to the extent that I have to use it to, you know, make, to get my podcast up and such. I can't say that I'm greatly knowledgeable. What that is, is really just a, uh, what happened was I had my friend Chris Glass did a beautiful design for the site um, a year or two ago where it kind of looked like a big file folder. And I, I, I still love that design, but... I've been playing around with the idea of just trying to basically take everything off the page except what, exactly what has to be there. And so I have a very white, <laughs> a very white page right now. It doesn't even have, you know, a logo on it. So I'm just experimenting with that. And uh, I'll have other changes coming. But I have this fantasy of having the page, uh, 43 folders, really just look almost like a piece of paper. You know, <laughs> I'd like it to eventually become like an essay on a page. I like it. You know, I should I should tell you that I, I have a masochistically Spartan taste in websites. So, you know, the more simple and the fewer things you can see on it, I, the better to me. Well, you know, it's, I, I, I must tell you that um, I, I hope this doesn't sound uh, provocative, but I, I think I think I don't sweat hypocrisy a lot. Um, I think it's something people worry about way too much because they don't want to be seen as a hypocrite. <laughs> but I don't sweat <laughs> hypocrisy too much. But the one thing I will say is it's a little bit hypocritical of me. To, to churn out a high volume of nonsense about managing your attention with a ton of, you know, a circus of visual things flitting around it. At a certain point, that I started to realize that that was incongruent. And so, yeah, I think if I have a site that says your attention is valuable and you need to uh, take care of that, I'm going to have to find other ways to make money that don't involve making people click a million things. That's just, that's just me, you know? Um, 
again, that's not a judgment. It's just a way of saying that for myself, that's a decision I had to make. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that design will be gussied up at some point, probably this summer. But I, I kind of like the idea of, I mean, have you ever had that fantasy of like taking everything out of your house and just kind of starting over? You know Indeed. what I mean? Like, Who get hasn't? A, I know. Like get a moving truck and a mover, moving guys to come and just take out everything except your coffee pot and your bed and just <laughs> say, okay, as I need this over the next five days, bring it in. If I don't need it after five days, take it away. Go take it to Goodwill. That's, that's kind of how I felt about the design. So the other thing you'd ask about, though, was the, the, the change in, in what I write about. So I, the overt difference for me is in my head, I've always known in my head that this productivity stuff should be about clearing off your desk in order to do great work. The trouble is if you're constantly writing about the clearing off of that desk and you're constantly thinking about all that, you're not really making anything. So I really like the idea of thinking about what you, what you do. What you make, you know, in Spanish, hacer, what is it you're going to make and do as a result of all that new productivity? And, and I have to be dead honest with you. I think most people, they just do more nonsense. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that for myself, and I don't want to encourage that in others. And so, you know, again, I don't want to be an ad merchant. I don't want to spend the rest of my life talking about notebooks. I want to talk about how people that I really respect are able to do great work. And, uh, you know, like I say, if that involves Excel or if that involves making a painting, Whatever. I mean, there's fascinating people doing great things, and I'm I'm slowly becoming a better and better student of that because it is all new to me. But um, yeah, that, that's the big change. I think that's the big change is getting away from what I what I've called productivity porn, and getting more into the idea of like how do you get a long live creative career um, based on that productivity. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Find our complete interview archive online at colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is Merlin Mann, speaker, writer, blogger, podcaster, founder of 43 Folders, and student of the creative mind. Now, this turn in 43 Folders has been a change from a site that I found very interesting before with lots of fascinating things posted to it. But now it's, it's, it's a place where some of the most resonant ideas I've heard in recent years have been posted. Uh, one of my favorite pieces in... Well, one of my favorite, one of the favorite things that I've ever read on the internet was uh, actually your post better, mm. which was a, a t- one of the main uh, planks. If I'm going to mix a few <laughs> metaphors, planks of the turning absolutely. of your site. Absolutely, and, that was, that, having written that was absolutely a huge influence on getting kind of to rethink the way that I approach almost everything. Could you tell us a little bit about about, about specifically writing that piece? I mean, what was this is it's emblematic of of the change in your site and in you. And what was the process of writing that? Was it an impulse you got it out there, or was it something you had to you let you had to let churn in your mind and on, on the page for a while? Or how did that come about? Wow, no, I, I wrote it in a few minutes, and uh, it's one of my it's absolutely one of my favorite things I've ever written. Uh, and for better or for worse, it's you know it's really how I felt. And I mean, just to be really honest, it uh, it was. During the run-up to the election um, in, in 2008, and I just – I felt like I was losing it. I was, I was just so overwhelmed by so much like nonsense, so much nonsense, nonsense. Everything was just crazy nonsense. It was er- everywhere. There was people speculating about things and spreading rumors, and everybody I knew had some kind of you know giant opinion that they had to share all the time. And I guess I just it was it made me aware of how how much excess there is in all these areas of my life in the media that I consume. And I don't mean to sound like one of those I don't watch TV kind of guys because I am. I do all kinds <laughs> of dumb stuff all day long. But it's, I started to realize that that I and the people around me were becoming very hard and cynical as a result of churning out this constant um, I don't know this constant supply of new opinions about everything. And, and I felt like, I, for myself, I felt like I was becoming really overwhelmed by getting way more information than I needed about a few topics with very little subtlety and tonality and, and craft to any of that. So again, so the combination in particular of Twitter plus the election just became too much for me. And uh, I realized I wasn't enjoying it. I realized that the, the people, me and the people I knew were not doing good work with it. And I just, I started to realize that, that I, it became, like I say, I mean, it became like a non-nutritional diet, you know? And so better, the essay, the better essay, which is just like I say, it's just a little short kind of rant. And I just realized I had this thing where I was like, I, I want to, I want to do less stuff better. You know, I don't want to, I mean, and again, I mean, I'm not, it's, it's not, it's not even like a, I don't mean it as a, 
as a you know a Martin Luther kind of thing. I mean, <laughs> it's more of a <laughs> philosophical approach of saying uh, if we all just tried a little bit harder and we thought just a little bit more, and we 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 became less obsessed with clicking the buttons that make. Uh, information move around and thought a little bit more about how our thinking and our cognition and our behavior and our decision making changes as a result of that information. And, you know, I, I ask, I've asked a dozen of my friends, well, how many times did you change your mind about who you're going to vote for during the election? And they all say, oh, I knew all along. I was like, well, then why were you reloading Huffington Post 40 times? A day? <laughs> what, how would, and this, this is really the crux of where my brain is on this stuff right now. How do you know when you have enough information to do something? Because I, I really feel like that combination of little easy motor skills and clicking combined with feeling a little bit less bored for a minute is completely addictive to people. And when we all, when the main way that we communicate with each other is through all these things, and th this is not like, I'm not saying don't use Facebook. I'm not saying don't use Twitter. What I am saying is if you aren't mindful about the amount of your attention that goes to thinking about and consuming those things, you're, you're not really going to be making good stuff either for that medium or elsewhere. And, and that's that's what I got kind of hung up on when I finally realized that all I was doing was just – I felt like I was just eating and producing potato chips all day long. And when I read the piece better, I couldn't help but, you know, clench my fist in victory that I read something that articulated better, a point I tried to impress on friends, which is, look, we're all going to die someday. Nobody who is not immortal has time to read a shovel blog, you know? Yes, it's true. And, and but I mean, the, again, all this stuff, this stuff is complicated. There's no simple, easy thing here. I'm not saying don't have fun. And I'm not even saying, I'm not even saying don't waste time. All I'm saying is just be aware and, you know, and be to a certain extent mindful. And, and if you don't, again, if you don't ask yourself how much information you need to do what you need to do, you'll never know when you're done. Right. And you're just going to keep drinking water until your kidneys ex explode. <laughs> and I, I no, I agree with you though. Um, I, I, I just, it's, you know, I think a lot of the solutions people have offered for this stuff is <laughs> along the range of either, well, adapt. You're just going to have to learn how to SMN, uh, SMS for 21 hours a day. Or <laughs> on the other end, you go, oh, well, I'm just going to throw away my computer and my TV and like, you know, sit on a mat and think, well, it's neither one of those. Life's complicated. That's the only way that it's, this is just Buddhism 101, really. The only way that you are going to survive in this world and any other is to keep your head in the moment and to become aware about what it is that really matters to you and, and how the stuff you do relates to that. So anyway, that's all I'm saying. It's funny that I, I think, I don't know if I'd call it ironic, but it is funny that it was actually a tweet that made that resonate with so many people and made them took made them take, uh, from what I understand, a long, hard look in the mirror when you wrote about on Twitter the, the obese man who, who eats cookie dough and complains that runner's world hasn't given him enough tips to go running. It's true. It's, it's absolutely true. And that's, that, that to me, that, that really, yeah, that, that was a pretty good summation. I think that's pretty much what I said. But, you know, there's all these people sitting around. If you read these blogs and the comments, it's like I, I got so many kind of nasty notes from quote unquote fans about how I wasn't feeding their need for more tips. Oh, man. Well, I have to tell you, and like, I don't mean to, because I appreciate it. I'm grateful that people like what I do, but I'm also becoming increasingly confrontational with people who go, I can't wait till this new thing comes out, whether that's an Apple tablet or whether it's a new release of a text editor or whatever. And I increasingly will say to them, well, what are you unable to make today with what you've got? What, and, and, you know, or put differently, what's the best thing you made last year that you're really proud of and how will this help you do that again? I, you know, I, I, I just, to me, you're absolutely right. You're going to die. You're going to die. And nobody's going to care which version of the iPhone you used to make something on Twitter or to, to go and like post about your bowel movement on Facebook. <laughs> At a certain point, and I'm not even talking about legacy. I'm talking about the fact that I personally feel most alive when I'm making something. And I feel least, least alive when I'm being led around uh, by some obnoxious use of my attention that I wasn't aware of. And so I, I really, that's, to me, that's the thing, you know, um, you you know, it, it, you can buy the jogging shoes and you can buy the runner's world, but until you put them on and walk out the door every day, you're just a fat man, <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's, there's no amount of information that's going to take the place of putting on the shoes and starting to move a little bit. And you're not really doing Taekwondo unless you're kicking people, you know, you're not really reading all the sex manuals in the world is not going to do anything until you're touching genitals. Otherwise you're just reading. So yeah, yeah. And it, but it's painful and people get mad when you say that because we derive a lot of our self-esteem and satisfaction out of these things that we choose to consume. 
And, uh, and that could just, again, I'm, I'm not even talking about Pepsi. I'm talking about blogs and I'm talking about Facebook and I'm talking about MySpace and what widgets you put where. We form our identity through all of these alliances that we build. And I think for a lot of people to say to them, well, what are you making as a result of that? Well, what they're making is a different version of their personality every day. But that's fine as long as that's what you want to do. <laughs> now, one of the points that I've distilled from this recent material that you've been putting out on 43 folders and elsewhere about making things is that is that if you're going to pile all of your focus into an area, pile it into making good things. And I don't want to say the rest takes care of itself automatically, but it seems pretty darn close to it. For example, I don't know how meta I want to get here, but on with this program, which is equally a radio show and equally a podcast, I... I only have one goal. The goal is to make good conversations and, and things, conversations as many people will want to hear as possible. And I, I, th I think to myself, if I just concentrate on that, just look at that bullseye, it's going to be okay. Now, is that, is that to your mind a perspective that works or one that's kind of lacking for nuance? No, I think it's not. I think that well, well, first of all, I mean, it sounds cynical when I say this. I'm not saying that all you have to do is produce great work and you'll become successful. I'm not saying that at all. What I will say is it's certainly a great first step <laughs> that before you worry about your logo and your marketing budget, start thinking about what you do that is really truly uniquely your own. Because um, that's one part of the success of the stuff that's so funny is is that <clears throat> the people seem to keep trying to, uh, to emulate the quote unquote success of other people instead of trying to figure out what they're uniquely capable of. Which, which is, you know, that's something most of us did when we were teenagers, but personally, I don't want to be somebody in my 40s trying to figure out how to be the next X person. Well, it's no different from carving your coconut headphones, you know, like the cargo cult. Right, it's, it's a cargo cult in a lot of ways. And, and so um, I think you're on the right track. And I think the other part of it is specificity. I think the other part of it is, yeah, figure out what your voice is and so you can know when it is your voice or not. But I also really like the idea of not being afraid uh, to, to have an obsession that you follow because I don't, I mean, if you're, if you're a generalist, you're going to have a lot of competition among people who are more polished generalists. But if you're very specific, you're going to have a lot more time to kind of find your own way. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's also a great business opportunity. You know what I mean? Mm. With the internet in particular, you know, if, if, so say for example, say you, uh, you live in a very small town, you're not going to start a, a, a comic shop. It's just about Marvel comics. And you're certainly not going to start a, a comic shop that's just about like one X man who died. A long time ago. <laughs> but on the internet, you could become like the dude for this one very specific thing. It's really a, a genuinely unique opportunity. And so, yeah. And then I think really trying to polish that. I mean, that's you know that's the other side of the blog stuff that's painful for me. Is sometimes I feel like God, everything I do is like a first draft. You know. Right. And, and we, we really excuse a lot of our own lack of happiness and success by saying that we're too busy with other things. And so, so for me, a lot of this becomes, well, okay, well, then how do I get rid of all that other stuff and do the thing that I'm kind of scared to be great at? And, and for most people, that's a terrifying prospect. The idea that they can't just kind of like apologize away how much they suck at something because they're busy answering email. Email and BlackBerry and all that stuff becomes a giant excuse for everything. It's a way to say, I don't have time to uh, be... To, to, to try to be great because um, I'm too busy. <laughs> I think you're on the right track, though. You know? and, and the other thing is, so, so, so finally, just to that one point, though, I think one reason I am so hard on things like email is that when I talk to really successful, either financially or artistically successful people, I, the, the pattern that I've seen is most people become great at what they do um, based on hard work, but based on making great decisions and on having great relationships. And that's just my own observation. But uh, to me, you, be, you, you, you have a happy life based on good decisions and good relationships. And to the extent that anything you do helps to build that, you're on the right track. But to the extent that you're just turning a crank for reasons you're not entirely sure of, well, you're just wasting your time. So, you know, again, knowing people like you, knowing people like Jesse Thorne, uh, you know, Jonathan Colton, like the, knowing these people who are kind of doing work that's orthogonal to what I do, it's just been fantastic for me because I meet more great people, like great input on what I do. And I start really feel like, feeling like I'm truly part of a community of people who get me and I get them. And, uh, and so, so if emails with those guys, fantastic. <laughs> emails with somebody who wants me to like link to their site, not so great. There's a frame of mind that is somewhat connected to this subject that I made, wanted to make sure to talk about, which is 
the shift from and anybody who starts an internet thing, whether it be a blog like yours or a, a, a radio show with, with uh, conversations, they do seem to start out thinking, I just want as many eyeballs as I can get. I want as many ears as I can get. I want as many heads that are sensate that I can get watching, listening to, smelling whatever I'm making. And it shifts over, and this was something you touched on in a podcast you did with John Gruber uh, recently, you're saying that, well, it's not necessarily to your advantage to want the masses. You want the cool people. Now, that's, 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 a, <laughs> a, caric- that's a caricature. Yeah, no, I, know, I know what you're saying, though. And I guess when did that... Did you start out wanting the cool people? I guess I should ask. Well, I mean, there's several ways to look at it. I mean, I think I think one one, one way to think about it is, um, it's it's no, absolutely. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's easy for me in retrospect to go, oh, you know, I never really wanted to be. No, I check my stats all the time. I'm completely <laughs> self involved. I I care about that stuff. I I like being you know well thought of. I mean, I'm not <laughs> I'm not an idiot, but um, my feeling is that you have to figure out. Who, who you want to delight is the way that I like to put it. And, and the qu- thing is, if you want to delight everybody, well, then that's going to have an effect on the kind of stuff that you do. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. I mean, look at somebody like Oprah. Like, she's had tremendous success. She seems like a, like a genuinely happy person. She likes doing what she does. Now, now, do you want to go out and try and be Oprah? Well, that's going to be hard because there's already an Oprah, you know, to paraphrase Ira Glass. And I think... <sighs> what's, what's the point of this all? I... I I think that I think that you will have a better response, a better and more effective response if you understand who's looking at your stuff and if you understand that you're speaking to people when you write something. I mean, that sounds so dumb and it seems so obvious, but you're speaking to another person. And to the extent that you can be yourself and talk to somebody as themselves, that's what great writing is, right? I mean, there's a certain kind of great kind of stentorian writing and speech writing where you are, you are addressing a Zola-esque crowd of people. But, but by and large, if you think about, like, it's funny, I was watching that, uh, that Bill Murray movie, uh, where the Buffalo Roam, that Hunter S. Thompson, oh, yes. movie, which is actually a pretty great little funny sleeper cult movie. And I thought about what it is that people emulate about Hunter S. Thompson. And obviously people, you know, you know, ape his persona as this drug addled guy and they ape, you know, the guns and the funny glasses and the funny hat. And they're just tracing shadows. Like what made Hunter Thompson, Hunter Thompson to me was he did have a unique voice and the way that he wrote was unlike anybody else. Um, it sounded like he was talking to somebody. He sound everything, almost everything Hunter S. Thompson wrote sounded like he was slightly drunk and writing to somebody that he really uh, liked in a very desperate, keening way. Like, like he had to finish this because there was so much he wanted to say and was just exploding with energy. And, uh, and that's the kind of writing that I want to do. No, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, you know, <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? Though? Does that, does that make sense? Indeed I do. Now I have to ask this because things seem to be pointing in this direction with all we've talked about, about doing well, about making good stuff, about establishing, you know, not networking, but actual relationships how much of the core of this is honesty with oneself? Uh, I think it's part of it. I mean, part of it's also just practicality. I mean, you know, I, I, again, I'm not trying to say I'm particularly great at any of this, but I will say that one reason I don't sweat branding is because I'm a terrible liar. Like, I, I, it would be very hard for me to pretend that I'm somebody that I'm not. And it, believe me, this is to my peril. <laughs> I mean, it would be so much easier if I just pretended to like 500,000 people on Twitter, but I don't want to. I read Twitter. <laughs> I read it because I want to read what pe- people that I like are saying. I don't do it to like make you like me. I do it because I like you. And, and that's just a disarming, annoying thought to some people. I, um, Gosh, why would you ever want to try and go pretend to be somebody else instead of trying to figure out who you are? You know, you're just keep, you're keep trying to find a better fitting mask. And, um, I mean, that sounds like California hippie BS, but I mean, that's the game, guys. You know, that's, that's what this stuff is about. Um, and so here's the funny part of all this, though. This is not, this doesn't mean you have to sit there and be some ascetic monk. I mean, I drink a lot and I'm crazy and I curse and I whatever and I make dumb mistakes. I'm a human being. But, you know, the truth is I've been able to attract a pretty broad audience for what I do by by being very specific about who I want to reach. And, and the, there's a funny self-selecting bias to that that delights me. I love when I post something on Twitter and a bunch of people unfollow me. It delights me <laughs> because that that is the sound of my audience getting better. When Because that to me, if somebody doesn't like what I said and they leave, well, first of all, Good on you for, for being too busy to follow this nonsense. But B, it tells me that I 
if I were always saying things that delighted everybody, I would know that I'm way off track. You know, the, Louis Althusser, a, a long time ago, talked about this idea of interpolation, interpolation and hailing, and this idea of uh, how you know, he's a Marxist, you know, critic, like, how do you know when somebody's talking to you? How do you know when a message is to you? And in the very same way that a message that CC to 50 people will generally get a response from none of them, I think that when you speak to, to, to no one in particular, that's exactly who's going to listen. And if I say to somebody and I speak to them, if I speak to them in my own voice, then they can make their own decision about whether they want to listen and follow along. But they, it's, the voice will be unmistakable. And to me, that's where the value is. Again, this is the internet is empowering this in a way that was inconceivable 20 years ago. So I don't know why you would just think of it as free marketing instead of an opportunity to, to figure out who you are in public. There's an element here as well of freeing yourself from the walking on eggshells mode where you, where one just desperately does not want to lose a single member of one's audience and thus falls into a mode where they lose a huge chunk of them because they're not saying anything fascinating. I think it's smart, though. It's something I do want to get better at. I mean, as I do things that, that are meant to reach a broader audience, you know, um, you, you can't afford that. You have, you know, the broader your audience is, and this is, this is really <laughs> what people don't get, is when you have a small audience, you can say a lot more controversial stuff or, you know, but the broader your audience gets, gosh, just look at all of the quote-unquote journalists who are getting fact-checked by people. Because they forget how many people think of themselves as content creators and smart people. The broader your audience gets, the more you've really got to watch what you say. You've got to think a lot harder, make sure your facts are in order. And, you know, you've got to be careful not to go offend people. Like, I offend, I, offend, I don't want to say religious people. I, I, I say I think I offend overly pious people who are more obsessed with uh, <laughs> religion than God. Uh, people who like people who have actually read the Bible and, and, and like the idea of God more than religion think I'm a, a stitch. But, um, you know, if I had a nationally syndicated radio show, I couldn't make cracks about Leviticus because my advertisers would drop off. So, again, in the same way that you have to think about who you want to delight in terms of your audience, you also have to think about, again, this is very much like a the wire kind of concept, but what system are you beholden to? you know, is the other part of this. If you derive a lot of your income from large amounts of run of network ads or nationally syndicated stuff, you got to be careful. I mean, there's a reason I, I'm guessing anything I've said here that was like, you know, uh, a, a, a bad word, you're going to have to blip, right? You can't put that on the radio. Well, yeah, there's a certain list. The well, no, no, and I'm not, that's not a criticism, but do you follow? I mean, even yes, somebody yes, yes. in a medium that's as fairly open as, as, as your own, You've got people that you've got to please. You're going to have to edit this for length. You're going to have to make decisions, you know, and to act like those decisions don't exist is, is ludicrous. Um, I, anyway, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> this does tie up with something I was discussing. Uh, I was discussing your imminent appearance on this program with a friend who is also into what you have been writing about and talking about lately. And he did mention he wanted to hear you speak about... When somebody has discovered what their creative superpower is, when they know what they can do well, what, how much have you thought about, I should say, how they might go about making that pay the bills? Mm -hmm. oh, it's, a, it's a really, it's a very, it's something I get asked a lot to the extent that I'm, I'm now thinking I should make it into some kind of a presentation that I do. Um, I mean, there's no one answer for that. The, the answer in some ways comes down to you. I mean, certainly there's been books about this. Um, well, there's that four-hour work week book. That I shouldn't get into. <laughs> wanna, yes, I get trouble. You know that guy. That guy. That guy cheats at martial arts. He could. He could almost beat my ass, probably. Um, is he, what, is, what does he push people out of the circle yes, and win matches? Yeah, yeah. No, he's 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 a, he's actually a really nice guy. I, I I don't care much for his book, but he's a very nice guy. So, if you want to do that, well, first of all, you have to ask yourself if that's what you really want to do. Um, you know, we do that. I do this podcast. You look nice today, and uh, I, I went to L.A. No, I'm sorry, not to L.A. I went to um, Portland and Seattle with, uh, you know, Jesse Thorne's, uh, Jordan, Jesse go group and my, you look nice today. Long story short, we went to a comedy festival, a comedy thing. And uh, I met all these, all these comics and I met all these people who are, you know, trying to be successful in comedy. I met all these like agents and, you know, I, I, I had this weird breakthrough though, where I thought what I wanted to do was, was make appearances at places like that. And I so disliked a giant majority of the people that I met that I, that I, that I realized, <laughs> wow, I'm glad I learned about this early on. 
Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you got a, you got a touch of the oven burner without actually holding your hand. Kind it. of. Well, I guess I guess I had this idea in my head. I, I mean, it's always so funny to me when I meet comics and they're not funny, where they're just very serious and morose and more career driven than most people <laughs> on the street. And and but I mean, I just it, it's this oh, my perception. This is just my perception. My perception of it was it's a giant status game, and there's a lot of name dropping and there's a lot of backstabbing. And I was like, wow, this is not funny or fun. Like, why would I want to be around this? And it really made me kind of rethink how I want to interact with that kind of work. So why am I telling you all this? Because this happens all the time. People who are like, I knew I wanted to be a doctor since I was five, or I always wanted to be a lawyer. I have a lot of friends who became lawyers and hated it. So <laughs> there's no reason to think that, that your own career in the arts or the personal publishing is any different. Make sure it's what you want to do. Make sure that you really have a lot to say about something and that you have a giant amount of tolerance for, first of all, making no money, for it actually costing money for a while. Because, you know, if you want to do this stuff right, you're going to have to hire lawyers and stuff. Um, and it's costly. It seems free just because you can get a free blogger account. But ask, ask anybody who's trying to make this scale. And it, it takes dough. And it takes a lot of patience. And then it takes a lot of self-awareness to be open to the fact that you may become popular about something that you didn't want to become popular about. <laughs> you don't get to, at a certain point, you don't get to pick that anymore. <laughs> it sounds like it takes some vigilance to avoid falling in with a crowd who does not care about making good things. Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way personally. I mean, that, that's, that's certainly, that sounds like something I would definitely say. But for the folks, if I were giving advice to people, I guess all I would say is, First of all, I mean, again, there's certain books that I keep coming back to. This book on writing by Stephen King was so inspirational to me because uh, I'm not a giant fan of his novels, but I loved this book. And what I walked away, I just walked away with a huge amount of respect for Stephen King because, like, I don't know if he still does this today, but, but Stephen King writes two or 3,000 words a day, and that's his job. You know, sure, he also makes a shit ton of money, but you know what? He sits down, and he knows he's done when he's written 2,000 words. And if he doesn't, he keeps writing. It's a craft. It's, he's, it's a craft and it's a job. And I think for all of this stuff, to get out of this idea of saying like, oh, it's free money on the internet and increasingly get more into the idea of like, it's a way for me to become good at something I care about in public. If you find a way to make money doing that, you're going to live the dream. Um, but if you just keep focusing on the money part of it to the exclusion of keeping your life in order or to the exclusion of actually getting great at it, it'll get in the way. You know, there's a lot of people, I mean, you ever have friends that got signed to a label? Like their band, <laughs> oh, right? Boy. You know, anybody who, where that turned out well? Uh, no. No, no. It, it uniformly goes terrible. So be careful what success you really want. For me, like I've reached, I've got almost exactly as much success as I'll ever want. <laughs> I, would not want be, I would not want to be any more well-known than I am right this minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a fine point to go out on. Merlin, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you, Colin. It's been a delight. Find out more about Merlin Mann at MerlinMann.com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. Find our complete interview archive at ColinMarshallRadio.com, plus other fun stuff. Our music, as always, is produced by Ben Althaus. Hear more of his stuff at BenAlthaus.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.